haven't been around for a while. Um, glad, glad to see you here today. Um, whether you've been celebrating the festive period or just enjoying time with family, it's good to be able to do that, isn't it? And, uh, even in the, this awkward time of uh, a semi-lockdown sort of thing that we're having and, and what have you. So hopefully things will pick up again in the new year and we will we move on uh, with our lives again. In Luke chapter 2, in the first seven verses, it says there, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So the word used for inn could mean just a guest room in a, in a house, and the chances are, that they may have been going back to spend time with family. That's where Joseph was for, from, after all. So he may well have been going back to family, and just when they got there, they maybe the last to arrive, and there was a big family or whatever, and there wasn't any room, so they had then to go into the, the animal area at the back of the house or whatever. Or it could mean, as simple as we see it in most texts, and in the way it has been portrayed over the years, it could well have been uh, some kind of a guest house or, or inn that they were staying at. Really, that's not that important. What is important is there was no place for them, because we should always be making a place for the Lord in our hearts. Jesus went to prepare a room for us all uh, in, his, in our heavenly home, and it would be right for us to give him room in our lives in this day and age, especially in a world where it seems to be the last thing on many people's minds. Our first song is in keeping with us 376, and it says, Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. After we've sung this, uh, I'm going to ask Robert to lead us in prayer. If you can, let's stand together and sing. Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let Father, it is a 
Dundee or Joy for, for us to be here in this place that we can meet together uh, in peace without any persecution. And we look to other parts of the world, Father, where we suffer for praising you and worshipping you. Father, we thank you that we are blessed to see the start of a new week. And we thank you, Father, for blessing us in the, the week that's gone by. We know, Father, we should often take the many gifts that you have blessed us with, Father, for granted. And we know, Father, at this time where when people are giving and receiving gifts, and we need to realise, Father, the, the greatest gift of all that we give to the world. We know, Father, it's a special time where the world, for some, do think back to that, that one of your, your son Jesus when he came into the world. But we know, Father, that we can give thanks to you, Father, at any time for that greatest gift of all that you gave to the world, Father. A saviour that can save us, Father, from sin and temptation. And we can look towards a, a place that has been prepared for us, which is, again, the greatest gift, Father, that we can receive that awaits us. Father, bless us this morning as we worship you in the songs that our brother Nix has chosen. And that the songs, Father, will reach your ears. And as a, a way of praise, Father, for us to say thank you for your gift, your son Jesus. I we thank you, Father, that he was willing to give his life on Calvary's cross. And that we can receive the, the blessing, Father, of life eternal. Father, we pray for those of our number who need your, your help. Flesh, their health. You know, Father, you know their needs, and we pray, Father, that you can also understand, Father, what their needs are, if you can help them in any way. We bless us, Father, today as we worship you, and we pray all things to be done according to your will. And we're asking these things to your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. The message that the angels declared at the birth of Jesus wasn't so much that a child was born, although that was part of the message, but that a saviour was born. And what a message that is, what a fantastic message it is to take to the world. And as Jesus grew up and became the sacrifice of God, uh, and to enable us to have a relationship with him, what a friend he is to us. So number 274, I've found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, the lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. He is all there is in the terms of salvation. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So let's sing this one together and just remain seated as we sing. After this, we'll be uh, having this morning's reading from Michael. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Yeah. 
morning of reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this time I'll ask Michael to bring that to us. Good morning, brethren. Or we are grateful to God for bringing us here once again. Seeing faces, always nice. Uh, today's Bible reading will be taken from First Corinthians chapter six, and I read the whole chapter. If any one of you has a dispute with another. Do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is certain in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your brothers are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not on your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your lives. This ends today's reading. May God bless us all. jumped out at me during the, the reading. Um, verse 11. 
has described all these immoral ways of living, and he says, and that's what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The implication being, God has changed you, so you need to change. If you're living that way, stop living that way and start living the way you ought to live. But God has changed us, and he's sanctified us, and he's justified us, and washed us. And then towards the end, You were bought with a price. You are not your own. You were bought with a, a, a price. So therefore, honour your God, honour God with your bodies. So again, live your life in such a way that it brings honour to God, because God has bought us with a price. We've been redeemed. We've been bought back by God uh, and by the blood of Christ. So let's sing of our Redeemer, number three hundred. Sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. So we stand together and sing. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me.
was came as a child, uh, but grew up to be a man who would give his life on the cross. And although he came as a child, that was just the human form. Because Jesus existed before time. And he shared the glory of God. But he counted that as something not to be grasped. He came and gave his life on the cross for us. He left behind, if you can think of it in physical terms, the ivory palaces of heaven um, to become lower than the angels to serve mankind. So I've started before we invite Mike to share his thoughts at the supper. This is number 343. And the Lord has garments so wondrous fine and myrrh that texture fills. Myrrh was brought to him as a gift uh, while he was still a child. But it was also there towards the end of his life. And it's something that is seen to be given to uh, those who are worthy. Its fragrance reached to his heart and mind with joy my being thrills. It's when we think of what Jesus has done for us, it is something that can thrill our hearts as well as touch our hearts. Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe, only his great eternal love made my Saviour go. He loved us before time began. He continues to love us now. What a wonderful thought that is. So before Mike brings his thoughts at the table, let's uh, sing together number 343.
Papa Mike has led us around the table. We'll be singing 673, and then we'll conclude with 717. Mike, I've just noticed the clock's stopped at the back of the hall, so... <laughs> I've no idea what time it is at the moment. <laughs> no, it's not in the slightest, but I've no idea what time it is at the moment. so I'm not going to really see what I'm reading either. <laughs> um, well, I tell you, um, it seems very sparse in here compared to yesterday, with all the bright lights and all the excitement of the children being around and all the coloured paper and all the rest of it, and this uh, secular Santa festival, <coughs> as it's now come to be. Uh, I think most of the advertisers have given all up, up all pretense of pretending that it's to do with Jesus in any way whatsoever. And I think as Christians we've known that for years, um, is that uh, this festival, this particular time of the year, uh, is a problem for some Christians. In fact, I know that to be true. It's a conscience issue with some Christians and uh, others. It's not. Okay, So we have to kind of rely on uh, treating each other well uh, around this time of the year. Uh, and I'm just glad that we don't drag in Christian into Christ Christmas into our worship services. I was reading, uh, well, I was watching some YouTube videos yesterday, which I like to do um, throughout the year, because uh, you can learn a lot from other preachers just listening to what they have to say. And uh, I came across the one uh, today, uh, well, sorry, yesterday, which I gave out a uh, listen to, and it was about. Why the Church of Christ don't celebrate Christmas? I thought, oh, that'll be interesting. Mm. And the guy was spot on. He knew exactly what he says, didn't he? He knew all the scriptures he would have uh, gone to to have a look at. And it, but he did forget the one where Santa Claus is definitely in the Bible, uh, which I, <laughs> I preached about once, because uh, uh, Santa means saint, and Claus is short for Nicholas, and it means Saint Nicholas, and there is a Saint Nicholas in scripture from uh, the book of Acts. We know that he attended tables and helped the widows in Acts chapter uh, 6, I believe it is. And, uh, and so therefore, I have a, can have a little bit of fun there with that. But I'm just glad we're here today to, to get relief from all of this festivities and we can actually just focus on Jesus and enjoy his, uh, the truth of him and who he is as our Saviour. I'm thankful we have s uh, the Saviour, not Santa. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what a difference. Santa lives in the North Pole. Christ lives in heaven, above everything, above all power and authority, of all, of all heaven and earth. And so it's good to remind of that. It's kind of spiritually a relief uh, to, uh, to come here. And I think the scriptures this morning are flee for, from immorality, uh, Michael read today. Flee from that. Flee from it. And there's sometimes spiritually you just want to flee from the world and get away from it and get, get close to Jesus and, and allow him to, to spiritually speaking, to wrap, wrap himself around you. Uh, and so it's really important to, to do that together. There's also another YouTube video I came across. It was called The Theology of Christmas. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. And the passage that he, uh, this preacher focused upon was, in fact, the one that you just mentioned, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, which I'll just read uh, a few verses from in a minute. Um, and this uh, passage of Scripture that he was referring to, he started off asking, well, if you look at this time of the year from a different perspective, uh, how, how do we see it? How does the world see it? How does the secular world see Christmas? How do Christians see Christmas? How does God see Christmas? What's the theology of Christmas? Because we do know that Jesus was born. Uh, we know that. So there's a theology that surrounds that. Uh, that theology, if you like, has been completely forgotten by the world. It's, it's no, no longer relevant to the actual meaning of uh, this, this festival period. Uh, so as Christians, we need to be uh, very careful that we don't buy into anything to do with this particular time of the year uh, on a spiritual level, on a theological level. And so Philippians chapter 2 is a very good passage of Scripture that we can actually kind of read together. And uh, Paul starts off writing there to the church at Philippi, and he says, therefore, in verse 1, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or mercy, complete my joy and be of the same mind, 
by having the same love, being united in spirit and having one purpose. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should in humility be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but about the interests of others as well. So you can see the theology here is very important to, uh, to Christians to be encouraging to one another. There's no room for arrogance in the church. There's no room for uh, you know, putting yourself ahead of others or setting yourself up in a high chair and saying, I know better than anybody else or I want my way in church and I don't care what anybody else thinks. That is not the spirit of God. It doesn't work in, in the Lord's church. We are under humility. We are under submission to God, the Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ. And so that is the attitude we are to have. And in that way we can encourage one another. In fact, Paul goes on to say, you should have the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had. What? Well, what attitude did Jesus have? Well, Paul goes on and says, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God some, as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. That's his birth right there. Okay? He came into this world as a human being. He took upon himself the form of a human being. And he let go something in heaven. And those who believe in the Trinity and, and that you know, Jesus was absolute God in every sense, I think should have a real great difficulty with that. Because he emptied himself. He let go of something. Something they always had. Um, the word there, grasped, that I mentioned, that he, he, he didn't hold on to it. Um, it was often in other translations, one of them is robbery. He didn't consider it robbery to hold on to this thing. Uh, I think it's a bad translation, the word robbery. Uh, it means to let go of something you've always had, something that you retain. He didn't think it was something that he wanted to hold on to or retain for himself. But rather than that, he let go of that. And so how do you say, well, how was Jesus still God then? Interesting question. Okay, uh, but we know from many scriptures in, in the New Testament, especially the book of John, the Gospel of John, that, that Jesus was God in the flesh. So we know that from scripture, it's revealed to us. So we know that Jesus was God. That's a gimme. But then Paul says, you let go of something. So if you believe in the Trinity, the equality of Jesus with the Father in all ways, then you've got a big problem. And so here we have Jesus coming in the form as a man, and yet still God in every way uh, in his nature it says here okay you have a human nature don't you all of us have at least I hope you do um, right we all have a human nature now if I chop my left my, my other left my right leg off <laughs> right if I chop my right would I be any less human I would still have the human nature in fact if I lost my left arm lost most of my body I'd still be human I'd still have the human nature I've lost attributes in a way I've lost some glory as a human being because you know I'm not able to function fully as a human without these limbs um, if I lost my speech or my sight I'd still be a human being you could lose a lot and still be a human being uh, and in Jesus well what did he let go he let go of his position in heaven he let go of his attributes. So no longer could he just snap his fingers and create a universe as he did before. He was spoken into existence and he was the agent of creation, some would call it. He could no longer do that. It relied fully on the Heavenly Father. He says, I can do nothing without my Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit came upon him and then he was able to do the works that he was able to do, all the miracles. So some would say, you're talking blasphemy here. You're saying that Jesus was not omnipotent, omnipresent, and uh, om omniscient, okay? No, he wasn't. But he was still God. How do you know that? Well, because the scriptures tell me he was still God. So can God be God without his attributes? Yes, he can be. Why do I know that? Because the scriptures tell me that. I get my theology from the scriptures, and not from some 
idea of men. And I, I take that at face value. Jesus was, was God in his very nature in human form. Lovely. It's not that difficult to understand. But we're, sometimes we're indoctrinated with all these other ideas. It's the struggle of the scripture sometimes to come to the truth uh, about these things. So I'm happy with that for myself anyway. And uh, <clears throat> so he humbled himself in becoming a man, becoming a baby. And what a difference between yesterday and today in celebrating his death, the death of this man. Everybody wants the baby. Everybody wants to celebrate his birth. But who wants the man? Who wants the, the death of Savior on the cross? doesn't sound like good news, so please just tell me about the baby, just leave the man bit out of it. That's not good theology, because you've missed the point. That Jesus came into this world a baby to grow up and then die on the cross. That's the theology of his birth, his death. And so we are going to celebrate that now as we consider the spiritual truths. And although we have that little cracker and that tiny little bit juice, that would hardly be even a little bite of my starter yesterday <laughs> around the table that has such huge significance. It, it's a spiritual feast of thought and theology behind that. And so as we consider taking this together, let's bow our heads and give thanks to, to God for Jesus. We thank you, O Lord, for Jesus, your son. We thank you that you came into this world to die for sinners like us to shed his blood on the cross, to have his body nailed to that tree. But you gave us him, Father, the great gift, the greatest gift of all. Not wrapped in paper, but wrapped in blood, wrapped in death, and buried, Father, wrapped in the earth. And yet he came back again three days later, for your glory and for his own, and ultimately for our glory too, Father, as you invite us into your glory through him. We pray that you'll bless us as we share in this bread together, and Father, we ask that you would bless us as we've chosen, as we speak, as we seek the spiritual truth, Father, and speak your word. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. pray that as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we pray the fruit of his cup will be a blessing to his children. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Jonathan Dresden. What an amazing thought, having just focused on why he came to give his life for us. To think that he rose again, and because of that resurrection, we have hope of eternal life in him. What an amazing thing. Absolutely amazing. No wonder we want to give him the glory. Number 673, thine is the glory, risen, conquering son. Endless is the victory, thou Lord death hast won. Angels in bright raiment, there was angels at his birth, there was angels too at the end of his life and at the resurrection. Rolled the stone away, kept the folded grave clothes where the body lay. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering son. Endless is the victory, thou Lord death has won. If you can, let's stand together. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering son. standing we'll sing the final song number 717 we have because of that resurrection victory in Jesus after we've sung this mark we'll leave the thoughts and close in prayer Victory, oh victory.
Father, as we come before you at the close of our joint worship today, it's our prayer that we have had our minds and hearts in the right place to worship you properly. We pray for the world at large, that it can make it through this new wave of the, of the pandemic and that we can soon come out of it. able to meet together properly, to, to have fellowship with each other, but also to share you with the world and not have to, to hide our faces and, and let the, the, the joy of our life in you be seen in its full glory. We're mindful of those who are, are part of this congregation who are unwell and also those in the world at large who are unwell. We pray that they can find healing, whether that's in this life or in a spiritual life that gives them healing in the, the next life. We are so, so mindful of your blessings. We may not thank you for them on a regular basis. We may not even notice them all the time, but we know truthfully that they are always there. And we just thank you so much for those. As the world is, is celebrating Christmas, <coughs> Christmas, we pray that while we may enjoy the festive time, we are not so focused on Christmas, but Christ mess. We want to be like Jesus, and we pray that we can do so each day of our lives. We thank you for his sacrifice, and it is the greatest gift anyone could possibly need. And it's through your Son that we pray. 